This morning I want to welcome Prof. Jonathan Kailov from the Telfer International School of Management uh, slash Business uh, situated in Ottawa, um, Canada and uh, he's been visiting us for the last 20 years on a regular basis and uh, uh, Jonathan we welcome you. Um, I know his specialization is strategic in intelligence and, and business analytics and he's involved in a lot of a lot of committees and, and associations worldwide and uh, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure, Jonathan, to have you back here once again. Um, I hope you enjoy your stay. Absolutely. You forgot my most important title, which is Extraordinary Professor with NW, with this university. Yes, that's right. That's, that's, right. that's the big one. <laughs> You'll keep me coming back for years. Yes. Um, I think if there's somebody that, uh, that have an overview of, of, of what's been happening in, in our economy, and I talk about our leadership crisis, and the political uh, factions fighting all of the show. I'm talking about hardcore markets. Um, what is your take on South Africa from a from from a foreign knowledgeable of South Africa from a foreign point of view? Well, I mean, and, and without trying to be overly pessimistic or optimistic, um, my starting point in looking at the opportunities in South Africa has to be when apartheid ended, and there's a short. Whenever that happens, there's a short term honeymoon opportunity to attract foreign direct investment, uh, to expand. There's, there's goodwill. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't taken advantage of in the way that it should have been taken advantage of. And for a variety of political reasons and economic focus on other matters, the international file did not appear to be successfully executed. So if that gets executed, mm -hmm. then what follows from there is continued foreign direct investment. Now, if you're talking about a North American perspective on South Africa, to be honest, the, the classic business manager owner trades in a way consistent with, it's called stages theory of internationalization. We'll start trading with those countries we yes. feel a psychocultural closeness. It's a reason why Canadians first market and unfortunately the majority market is the United States, followed by Europe. There's exceptions to that caused by industry. Canadians are here in mining because from an yeah. industry perspective, that makes a lot of sense. So I, the first thing would be, it's not on the mind of a lot of Canadian businesses for this to be a priority market. Yeah. There's a lot of other markets that come before that. In terms of perception of risk, if you're thinking of Africa as, as the country to go to, mm -hmm. obviously this is a lower risk, uh, higher benefit perception in terms of of laws, regulation, language, and a lot of other matters, it's far away. But again, that's if your perception is, I'm going to go to Africa. Yet, uh, I'm also doing work in Morocco, where senior business leaders from major North American companies are saying very clearly, if you want to come to Africa, you better get your butt over to Nigeria, because that's what's growing and that's where action yeah. is happening, despite the risk. So the big companies mm -hmm. are saying, Nigeria is going to open up, get here before that happens, and we see some signs. Yeah. So I mean, think about what that means, because you asked me the question about perception of risk. Yeah. Nigeria on every risk index, <laughs> okay, way higher, uh, but the businesses are saying if you're coming to Africa, not a bad place to go. Yeah, yeah. Let's come back to one of your pit laws and that strategy. Um, or rather competitive intelligence, but I just want to ask you something about strategy. Two questions. Do you really believe uh, the five forces are still five forces? There's a lot of opinions that said no, technology is actually the sixth force, uh, whereas some people might respond say that's an enabler. And, and secondly, what, is, what do you think is the next level for strategy? Okay, we talk about Michael Porter's five forces, which is the dominant technique used around the world when the question is, is it a good market? Yeah. Now, let's be very clear about it. Yeah. Well proven, not a bad technique. You've got a six forces model by another author and an eight forces model by, by yeah. a third. What I tell my clients and my students is very simple. Is you take the analytical model that's proven itself over and over again, and then you figure out what factors are missing that are relevant to my environment. Let me give you a very quick example. In my country, Canada, versus the United States, where the model was created, government intervention in the marketplace in Canada is very big, through tax policy, through investment policy, through regulations. As you know, the U.S. Op operates with more of a 
hands-off approach. Yeah. So it's not surprising that Porter's model doesn't have a lot in the area of government intervention. And Dr. Porter was asked about that. The answer is kind of, well, maybe in entry yeah. barriers, but it's based more on an environment that's, quote, stable, uh, non-interfering. It doesn't mean the model's flawed. It means, okay, well, for those countries, add in those factors yes. included in your analysis. You also have to recognize the strategy that certain elements of the five forces might be more relevant to what you're trying to do than the other elements of it. Yeah, of so uh, uh, Babette Ben-Susan and Craig Fleischer came up with a great book looking at strategic analysis techniques where what they did for five forces, for life cycle, for many of these techniques is they said what it's good for, what it's bad mm -hmm. for, and how you're going to have to adapt it as you go through. But the five forces model itself explains a heck of a lot. It's yeah. a great economic model if you adapt it for the situation you find yourself in. Great. Um, and what do you, we always try to get a snapshot of future. What do you think about strategy? I think link that to competitive intelligence, which is a function of a lot of, uh, a lot of clusters like, like knowledge management, etc. Um, in South Africa, we, we tend not to implement that well. But at the end of the day, you know, um, I mean, we, we, we parallel to that, we see this as, as, as a setting of goals, which is not even touching on the essence. Your, your reply to that, Jonathan? Okay, I'm going to tell you where, where, things, where things are going, yeah. and whether you want to call it strategy or else what, or something else, which bodes well, by the way, for South Africa, let me be yeah. very clear. Uh, it's about open innovation, open corporations. There's no question. EU has put a lot of money into this at a policy level. Uh, many of the major companies in the world now have huge targets for open in it. What we we're saying now is that the old model on strategy and the resource side of it assumed that we controlled all elements, yeah. including the IP. The new model is saying absolutely not. And uh, companies like Procter & Gamble saying that up to 50% of revenue coming from open innovation. They even had a rule at one point that says if we've invented it and haven't commercialized it within three years, we can license it to competitors. Yeah. Now think about what that means to the core strategy model. It, it works in terms of identifying opportunities, or does it? Because identifying opportunities now says we can enlist the crowd to identify opportunities with us and vote on them at the same time. So every element of the innovation value chain yeah. has been successfully opened up. Now, what we do in terms of competitive intelligence foresight says let's understand what the external environment is saying about what opportunities are out there, what threats, uh, what truly is innovative. When you say let's open that up, yeah. now you're saying it's not just going to be the few people at headquarters with strategic responsibility, it's not going to be our annual retreat, we're going to bring in customers, we're going to bring in suppliers, we might even bring in competitors, government regulators, and say, let's work together on where we see the world going and then tie that back into our strategy. So think of this as the boundary of the corporation, the walls are down. Interesting. Okay, Interesting. now why is that great for South Africa? It's also great for Canada. The ability to do complete value chain within the organization is not easy for many organizations. They are good at one function, not the other. Yes. By talking about opening up, and that's about collaboration, you're now saying, hey, I got a company in Cape Town that's really good at the R&D side. I got a company in Pretoria that's really good on the marketing side. And by the way, I got some South Africans in the United States who've got extraordinary networks Great. and a techie <laughs> because I'm thinking about where you guys immigrate to in, in Toronto and Ottawa, we've got mm -hmm. great communities. We now link all these people up together for the benefit of the country and the company. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it's not about we're going to do everything and how many billion dollar companies do we have. It's about the uh, value added at each stage of it and the element of that going to South Africa. Great stuff. So it's basically, uh, we have to conclude the session, is basically from crowdsourcing, which we're still grappling with, to idea sourcing. So, uh, oh, no, it's the whole bit. It's even on the manufacturing. It's even on the... Uh, every element of the value chain is now, is now being opened up. And I'm not telling you this is what is emerging in the future. What I'm telling to people in South Africa is this is here now in a very major way. And congratulations, because the lack of investment in certain areas in the past 
no longer harms you. Yeah, yeah, you just have to figure out, and this is where CI comes in, what are we really good at? What does the world really care about? And where are the best minds? Now, open innovation starts off with the following, and I'm going to leave it after that. Not all bright people in the world work for your company. Don't you wish they did? <laughs> yes, they can. Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, nice having you and speaking to you once again. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Enjoy being here. Thank you.